Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome everybody to today's conversation. We have a new format that I'm really excited about. We have with us today the Consensus Crypto Economics team, and we are going to talk about the current macro environment, the fundamental trends in Web3, as well as the connection between crypto and all of these other indicators. And hopefully we'll have some time to talk about some particular projects and catalysts that we think are important for the markets. With us today, we've got David, Yvonne, AJ, and James, who are all fantastic analysts on the team and who have a depth of experience in the markets. And with that, if you could introduce yourselves and talk about your focus in terms of looking at the markets, that would be fantastic. Yvonne, let's start with you. So I'm currently focused at global macro and crypto macro markets in general and understanding how these global macro forces impact both markets, Chad5 and crypto markets, as well as overall portfolio strategies across crypto universe. Hi, I'm AJ Mittal. Excited to be here today. I'm focused, similar to Vaughn, on the interplay between global macro markets and how it relates to crypto macro, and specifically around the interplay between the two and the correlations and how they break down and and, and if they don't break down and, and how they influence each other. And lastly, I spend a lot of time on treasury management, particularly at Consensus and then also within the DAO ecosystem. Hi, my name is James. Uh, I specifically focus on, similar to Vaughn and AJ, the current traditional macro landscape, its implications to crypto macro. And I've currently been focused on different types of implications and trends in the DeFi space and how what the long-term implications are in terms of what the fundamentals that folks should be thinking about, you know, as we continue to see some Fed tightening happening and additional fallouts that's probably going to come out as a result of all of this. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. My name is David Shuttleworth. I am an economist here at Consensus. I focus largely on token design, mechanism design, and doing deep analytics into the Web3 macro environment. Awesome. So great to have you guys here. Let's start from the end. Sounds like there's some inflation numbers that came out recently. There's been some Fed action. Can we summarize maybe where we are in terms of you know the real economy and the macro outlook? Broadly speaking, we are in an extremely difficult macro environment. Our base case is that we are currently undergoing a stagflationary environment, which means that you have a high inflation and a low growth, real growth. So it's probably one of the most difficult macro environments we have seen over the last 20 years. And in addition to that, the risks probably skewed more towards recessionary type of scenario as opposed to high growth, high inflation type of scenario. So that's where we stand right now. And we can certainly touch base on where we're headed from here. But I kind of want to stop and see if you got more questions. When's the last time that the U.S. economy was in stagflation? And maybe related to that is why isn't there growth what are the kind of the components or the underlying bits and pieces that have slowed everything down? I think if you look at throughout the history, we have been through periods of stagflation in the past. One of the biggest ones it was during the Walker Fed policy leadership. That was like in the 80s. We had a very high inflation. The economy eventually ended up in a recession because Fed moved very aggressively with interest rate hikes. So since then... What's interesting that we actually did inflation was, was in a structural decline and we didn't really have much of inflation over the last two decades as well, right? The inflation has been in a structural decline and the Fed policy basically adjusted to this environment where you have low inflation, right? So you have a very low inflation, 2% and uh, low potential growth. Low potential growth means that, you know, like in U.S., 
overall growth is uh, around 2% based, based on the different estimates. So in a developer globally, the potential real GDP growth has been declining and inflation also has been declining. So I think this environment certainly is bringing the memories from the past in terms of how do you manage the environment where things turn against you, which is that you have still very low potential GDP growth. In fact, right now you have a declining GDP growth. And, but inflation, because of both monetary side of the economy as well as the supply side of the economy, is elevated. So it is something that is extremely difficult to be addressed. I want to open up kind of the numbers a little bit. If I remember correctly, you know, it's been now three months of inflation year over year of like seven, eight, nine percent. And, you know, current interest rates are way, way below that. Real rates are certainly not keeping up with inflation yet, although the Fed has been quite aggressive in the response. You had mentioned both the monetary and the supply chain side. And, you know, I think about on the one hand, during COVID, this absolutely massive print of the US dollar as stimulus. And then on the other hand, we think of the supply chain issues that COVID caused, which slowed down the ability of commodities to be shipped around the world and more expensive manufacturing processes. But then also the war in Ukraine, making fuel costs and energy costs much higher. And so all of this is kind of bubbling up into some pretty strange economic environment. Is that the right way to look at the underlying causes? And am I getting my numbers right? So in terms of the narrative, it is a correct narrative how you laid it out. We have two problems, the supply side, which is basically it's not something that central banks can control easily. And then you have the monetary side or the demand side that they can control by reducing growth. I think what's widely accepted right now, which was open for a debate at least last 10 years, is that the money printing by Fed that we have seen during COVID, the fiscal impulse that was done in U.S., was inflationary. And I think in the past, there was a lot of debate whether some of these programs are inflationary. And there was a lot of debate that Friedman kind of school of economics would say, yeah, it's inflationary. But there was a lot of debate in the past that Fed buying, you know, a bunch of assets was not inflationary. I think right now there is a pretty much a consensus that what has been done during the COVID created lots of inflation on the demand side. So they can control that part. The part that they cannot control is the supply side, which is driven by exogenous factors. Yeah, and, and one thing I'd just add to what Yvonne said, you know, in, in COVID, we had an incredible coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, which we hadn't really seen to that extent in decades. And and certainly not really, you know, we had some in, in 08, but, but you look at, for example, the CARES Act, which was the Coronavirus Aid and Relief and Economic Security Act, passed in, in 2021. And that was a $2 trillion act. And that came in the forms of PPP loans to businesses. And also, you know, I'm here in Los Angeles, there was rental relief. And actually, all those were sort of shadow stimuluses or additional stimuluses on top of monetary easing that really spurred supply. And I think To Yvonne's point, where the Fed is at right now is they essentially have inflation that is threatening to to run away, which which was is one of their mandates. Remember, is is price stability, and when you have runaway inflation, they lose a lot of their ability to to influence the direction of the economy. So that's that's a, a big risk for them and, and central banks globally, and so that's kind of this challenge. But then they also see a, a labor market that's quite tight, and a tight labor market, you know, really also does support inflation because consumers have purchasing power and they have ability to spend. So there's this rear dynamic that was influenced by fiscal policy, monetary policy, and now they risk things running away from them. So let me ask some naive questions, which is inflation's nine percent, rates are, you tell me, between one and two percent. Does that mean we're going to 9%? Is that how this is fixed? So, the, yeah, the current policy rates in the 1% to 2%. Inflation is year over year 9%, but if you annualize it, it's probably around that too. I think the, the way to look at it is really around the yield curve. That's what we use a lot as our metric. And you can, 
you know, we look at the U.S. yield curve, but also look at global yield curves. But the yield curve is telling you right now at the two year, I think is at three and a quarter. And then the 10 year is actually below that. I think it's at 315 or something. And, and directionally, you're actually seeing a, a flat to declining yield curve. And, and what the, the market is telling you is that the, the Fed is behind the curve, that they do need to, to raise rates faster. And so our view is that they're going to, to raise rates into the, the 3% range. So we still have you know, another probably 150 basis points plus to go. And, and they, they may pause from there because when I, when I mentioned that declining yield curve, like you go 10 year all the way out to the 30 year, the market is telling you, the yield curve is telling you that Fed is going to pause because growth is going to really slow. And so their hiking path is actually going to put us into a recession, which we're already seeing signs of that. And you're actually going to get this place where they're going to pause and rates are going to come down. And that front end of the curve is actually going to come down again. Yeah. And so I think this idea that just because inflation is a percent, you know, you need to have nominal rates much higher. It can be very misleading, right? Because like AJ pointed out, the best economist is typically in the markets. So the most reliable economist is in the markets. Now, it's probably right that we have seen giant shift in the rates. If you look at what's being priced in the markets and the debate is now, of course, what the, that neutral rate is. We don't think Fed has basically capabilities to take interest rates at extremely high level. For instance, there has been various studies where if you take interest rates in the U.S. to 55 6%, which is what typical Taylor rule is, it's a Fed model that has been used across the cycles, it will be very hard for Fed to get to these levels because at that point, given very low potential GDP growth and if basically recessionary type of risks, that will be extreme. That will probably create deep recession. So we think, you know, markets are probably right where they need to be. We could see another sort of increase in interest rates. We can discuss that because of some exogenous factors. But what I'm trying to suggest here, this idea that we can just take whatever the inflation is and then you derive nominal leads out of that, that's probably misleading for a number of reasons. And the other aspect that is really important to understand the Fed has capacity to compress the term premium for interest rates. They have been doing that for a long time. So as long as the Fed has capabilities to manage the term premium, by term premium, I mean the risk premium associated with the U.S. Treasuries. As long as they can manage that term premium, as long as they can compress that term premium, we shouldn't necessarily link the level of inflation with the expected interest rates. One of the interesting outcomes is that the Fed's been fairly aggressive to move recently, and you do have this quite negative environment, and as a result, there's been a flight to quality, and that's meant that the dollar has become very, very strong. So lots of things are cheap in dollar terms, which is kind of wild given the state of the American economy. But I think it also points to the incredible power of being the reserve currency. I think that also has a lot to do with the next question I have for you, which is why do we care about macro? Why do we care that interest rates are going up and that growth is going to slow? How does that impact the fintech or the crypto markets? How does that impact technology? How does that impact growth companies? And maybe, James, if you've got a view on that connective tissue between the economists' take on the economy and then those of us that are looking closer at how do we build within these emerging technology ecosystems? To kind of hone in on AJ and Yvonne's point about the, the, the global macro landscape with the interest rates and, and the geopolitical risks and tighter financial conditions that they were all mentioning, it really has to do with, I guess, the relationship between investors' attitudes towards risk when comparing it to like traditional assets. And so in a period where growth is friendly to investors, they will retract and be a bit more conservative in these types of scenarios. And for the most part, you know, they'll, they'll think about these types of scenarios from a, like a risk on or a risk off perspective. And so typically, you know, during periods of expansion, AKA risk on periods, investors will have more wealth to allocate to risky financial assets, where while the opposite will hold true today for recessionary or risk off periods. And so, you know, for the broader uh, investors' perspective, 
that's kind of how I believe they, they're kind of looking at this implication from the traditional macro kind of going down into crypto macro. And then later on, we can probably talk about how to think about from a bottoms up perspective, you know, because prices have have severely been depressed as a result of this. But, uh, you know, for those that are in the game for the long term, there may be some opportunities there as well. We are so past risk off uh, into total decimation land, you know, where it's certainly valuation collapse, but also then, you know, a financial crisis within crypto as well as a liquidation cascade, which I want to touch on in a little bit. But maybe, Ivan, AJ, do you want to add to that initial point about the connective tissue? Yeah, so just quickly, my point is what we are actually seeing right now, which is really, really important to understand, is paradigm shift in terms of interest rate risk, right? And how that interest rate risk is changing the pricing and valuation of very long maturity cash flow. So most of the fintech and growth-like investments are very long maturity cash flows. So think about very long duration bond, right? It has the most duration. It has the most duration sensitivity. So the problem is that most growth companies, the tech companies and FinTech 2 and now Web3 companies as well, you know, it's all about projecting growth and discounting the growth to the present. And if you have interest rates increasing, then the most sensitive duration assets will lose more value. So we are seeing repricing across that spectrum in a very meaningful way, which is the same reason to say that the best performing stocks during the periods of low interest rate risk have been actually, right, technology stocks. Yeah, I think James and Yvonne nailed it. And to kind of bring that to the real economy, just just through one thread is like, what would be the most so because I think a lot of times people don't realize how important in interest rates are into our whole global economy and, and asset allocation and all the things that James and Yvonne mentioned. But what's like a levered purchase that most individuals have to do in their lifetime is housing. So we've already seen how interest rates have severely impacted the housing market in the U.S. and globally. So that's one. And then you start to go further and further down the curve. You can go into real estate cap rates. You can go into how businesses borrow. And then you bring that into markets and you bring that into tech and crypto as you think of technologies that require long times to realize their potential. And those need to get discounted. And as Yvonne mentioned, that discount rate is very influenced by the overall interest rates in the economy. And when the discount rate goes up, the the opportunity cost and therefore the valuation of the underlying asset goes down, which is what we've been seeing. I want to go to David with the next question, which is on top of the mathematical devaluation of stuff, there's been an actual financial crisis in crypto in the sense that there's been a blow up of a protocol, the Terra Luna sort of machine. And we can talk about how real or not real it was ever, but you know, that equation solved to market value equals zero at around 40 billion. And it kicked off a liquidation cascade very similar to what happened with the mortgage backed security crisis blowing up at the level of defaults on the actual mortgages, then going into derivatives, then going into the issuers, and then going kind of through the economy. This has happened in crypto on top of the interest rate environment and perhaps in relation to it as funds may have wanted to withdraw. And lots of stuff got caught in there. Certainly 3AC and then BlockFi and Voyager and Celsius and lots of others whose names we we don't yet all know. But I wanted to pose this question of like, what is a liquidation cascade first off? Like what are the mechanics in what happened? You know, and how should we think about institutions engaging with a SASA class and then experiencing like a financial crisis? Does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack there, but like we can start with like kind of like what that liquidation cascade like could have been. So, you know, in a general sense, it's it's literally, you know, there were a lot of different institutions like and, and firms like the ones you've mentioned and many others that we don't know and may never know that kind of got out of position and were taking directional bets and were over levered. And essentially their, their LTV, their loan to value rates, you know, they, they came out of place and they were liquidated just because the value of their assets that they pretty much, you know, they backed their, these collateralized loans with 
where, you know, in, in many cases like Luna were now worth nothing. So you had massive liquidations. They're cascading in the sense that like kind of one liquidation kind of triggers the rest. And I think that like it's it's hard to kind of empirically say like which one started which and 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 how what, what the exact origination is. But like in a general sense, it's like we had a compounding problem where the macro economy, you know, the U.S. economy, it was all bad. You know, there was a credit crunch. Rates are insanely expensive. Money is no longer free. Everything's at risk. Valuations are going down. And then within the crypto macro, you had institutions that were just taking incredible risk. And there just wasn't a lot of like risk management and a lot of even due diligence. Like some of the, the legal proceedings we see now in the documents, it's like, it's kind of like, hey, I don't have collateral. Here's my word. I'll pay you back. And like that just doesn't work when things fall apart. And that's what we really saw. We saw like very high leverage positions quickly and rapidly kind of eviscerate and unwind. One bit of context is also that people have been saying, when is the crypto market going to be institutional? When are the institutions going to enter? And, you know, you get what you ask for. The cycle this time around was quite strongly institutional. You had traditional hedge funds creating crypto arms. You had crypto funds having raised a bunch of money from family offices. They behaved you know, institutionally. So they were tied to sources of capital and they were much more sort of leverage trigger happy. The question I want to attach to this is, again, just a, a very simple one, which is how did these investors lever up? Like, What are the mechanisms either in with the OTC desks or with DeFi protocols to lever up? Like, what is that market for leverage? Yeah, so I, mean, I can touch base a little bit on that topic, right? And so I think what's really important to differentiate in a crypto landscape is that we have two major venues. One is the C5 venue, and the second one is the DeFi venue. What we have seen lately, predominantly, aside from the USD Terra issue that was kind of Lehman type of moment for uh, D5, but it's really a design issue and what we have seen that kind of currency trilemma issue in traditional markets. So we know why it failed from a fundamental standpoint. But what we have seen lately is really a replica of uh, credit crunch in 2008 or counterparty risk escalation in a C5 land, in OTC markets in particular. And one of the key problems there was, number one, there has been lots of lending done on collateralized basis. So when you lend your assets, you can either fully collateralize these assets, you can partially collateralize these assets, or you can do it fully on collateralized basis, which is typically done by basically researching somebody's balance sheet and saying, hey, look, this company can handle lots of risk. Let's deploy capital in a very uncollateralized version, right? So this was like the core problem in a CFI or credit card crunch, I would say, that we have seen in uh, most of these OTC players and crypto lending platforms. That's like one issue. The second issue is the regulatory piece, which I think it just needs to be very clear because the regulatory piece was not very developed, which opened the door for lots of misunderstandings. But one of them is that if you kind of look at source of the trouble is that most of the users have been depositing these crypto assets to some of these lending platforms not realizing necessarily the risk associated with them. So on one hand, you have depositors who are basically giving liquidity, and then that liquidity is taken and levered in many different forms across the OTC markets. That was another problem. So I kind of view these two issues as something that led to this escalation that we have seen lately. I think Ivan is exactly right there, particularly around like under collateralized or even no collateral. So I think like you know, when, when markets are good and, you know, you look at like a, like a three hours capital and like, hey, you're worth a few billion dollars on your balance sheet and Bitcoin is, you know, $50,000. Yeah, you're going to make the commitment to, to loan them money. But when that collateral either you know, is cut by 80% or whatever the case may be, or maybe there was even collateral, that's kind of when you get yourself in trouble. And I think like, again, like risk management just wasn't there. Regulation just wasn't there. There was like super reckless behavior. And I think the, the, the other one kind of built in and Avon touched on is, you know, a lot of these different exchanges and, and C5 platforms were offering, you know, very attractive rates. Like 
hey, stake your Bitcoin and Ethereum and you know get like an 8 or 10% APY, whatever the case may be, but they're not super forthcoming about what's being done with that, with those assets, right? Like they're lending them out to other OTCs or, or other entities that are doing very risky behavior as well, maybe borrowing them out or lending them out to people without collateral. And then what happens is when they default, like there, there's kind of like, there goes your underlying asset that you staked. And I think like that was one of the, you know, kind of the straw that kind of broke the camel's back was that you had these these institutions that were lending these things out. Users weren't very privy to it and they ended up, you know, kind of going underwater. What about on-chain protocols? What about, you know, things like Maker, Aave, Compound? Did those perform or did they fail out? James, I know you look bottoms up at the fundamentals of that sector. What do you think about how DeFi performed during the liquidity crisis? So when we looked at the DeFi protocols during this time period, we're pretty much going through a depressed macro environment. We, we did see a lot of the, the DeFi protocols, such as the one that you've mentioned, like Aave, Compound, and Maker, remain fairly resilient in, in maintaining their loan to value. So you know, that's not to say that DeFi protocols are, are perfect. I mean, they have their own issues to resolve in terms of, you know, things like getting hacked, you know, specific to this topic where, you know, a lot of the, the CFI, you know, has over leveraged, you know, we did see DeFi doing what it was intended to do, which was to liquidate and kind of, you know, keep, keep the parameters, the risk parameters intact and work as they continually should work. And so we saw that as a sign of, of DeFi working through these types of periods where others have actually, as we witnessed, not worked. So that that was an interesting observation that we've had here. And yet there were things that totally broke down, right? Like the relationship between ETH and stake teeth, the ability to trade it on, I think, curve because there wasn't enough liquidity in the pool to process a Celsius trade. So I think the machines you know, stood up much better than some of the centralized players, but also there were, you know, there were kind of cracks at the edges. AJ, what do you think about the fundamentals of like Web3 finance in this environment? Yeah, I mean, I think James brought up a really good point about how, you know, some of the principles of decentralized finance, of transparency, of, you know, code is law and having, you know, loan to values that are written within the contract that's that's viewable by every single participant that really held up. And that's something that, you know, you could argue in financial markets and as students of financial markets, we've never seen a crisis being worked through in real time in a transparent way. But then, you know, as David and, and Yvonne mentioned, the CFI part, the, you know, the, some of the three arrows or these other funds that we've seen that were doing OTC and, you know, mismatching user deposits with, with risk, that is actually something we have seen with, in, in traditional markets with the likes of like long-term capital management and things like that. And so I think one thesis of our team and one thing we see a lot is that we're seeing sort of the age-old trends kind of play out. But then on the other side, we're seeing this new emergent technology and structure that that has mismatches, as you mentioned, like with, with ETH and stake ETH and things like that. But then that also presents kind of a new model for how market operations can work with more transparency. And, and frankly, like, you know, this happened within seconds. I mean, we've seen a lot of the CFI players pay down their DeFi loans before now they're in their other holdings, they have to go through bankruptcy proceedings, which could take years, where the the DeFi money market protocols were able to resolve essentially liquidation problems within seconds. And that is that's something pretty incredible. Yeah, and, and if I could also add kind of like double clicking on the topic of leverage, and, and AJ is talking about stake ETH as well. For your listeners here, I think it's important to understand like how stake ETH kind of contributed to this episode that we're seeing here un- unravel. So for folks that uh, aren't aware, you know, brokerage firms and hedge funds have staked ETH, you know, with the anticipation of the merge coming in the coming months. And as a result, they got the ST ETH. You know, what they usually do with the ST ETH is to gain additional yield, they used it as collateral to leverage. And when STETH went down, as folks started to, to understand that the merge may be pushed out further, that started to cause some issues where folks had to then either fork up and increase their collateral or get liquidated. And I think that was one of the, the few triggers that kind of caused the unraveling of, of this leverage. And so that's one example where 
I feel like folks should understand like the origination of of how uh, Three Arrows Capital, Celsius, all of them participated in, in this episode. So that's the you know world is on fire set of stories. What else are you seeing across the space, and in particular, you know, are there things in Web three that are interesting, that are promising? Maybe we talk a little bit also about tokenomics and governance and the trends that tend to emerge in these types of times. You know, one thing that we've seen we've we've seen you know tremendous growth in activity, and we usually measure addresses, Web three addresses. So that's across. You know the Ethereum ecosystem, but other ecosystems like Binance and Solana and Avalanche, Polygon, and and so both Layer One and Layer Two ecosystems. We've we've naturally seen in this environment a decline in active active addresses, and that's similar to what yeah I would say stock market brokers or even you know like things like Robinhood are, are seen as well as consumers have less disposable income to be trading. But one emergent thing that is just kind of continued to hold up and hasn't declined as much as is NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So that is just an incredible area of the market that we've seen grow. It's growing both in Ethereum and across other C- ecosystems. And both the use cases, you know, there was kind of the PFPs and the profile picture ones, and then there's Bored Apes, and then there's Metaverse. And it's kind of exploding in terms of use cases, applications, things like that. And it's been an interesting bright spot in this sort of severe market downturn? I think that another metric we kind of look at is like, especially with like the Ethereum ecosystem is kind of like the daily transactions. I think, you know, over the last, you know, few months, like Ethereum transactions have, have pretty much stabilized. You know, they're, they're ranging between like one, uh, you know, one and a quarter million transactions per day, which shows that, you know, people are still using it despite like maybe there's not, you know, a, a surge in active addresses, but Ethereum transactions or transactions are still being done on Ethereum. I think that's like super important for like network health. And then there's like kind of the emergence of like new technology that further improves Ethereum. And not to jump too far ahead, but like, you know, this month alone, we've seen like a bunch of new, you know, EVM compatible zero knowledge rollups kind of emerge. Like you have Polygon announcing their version and Matter Labs and Scroll announcing their own versions. And kind of what this means is like, you know, looking back 12 or 18 months ago, it was kind of like, you know, the, the optimistic rollups were going to be the use case or the kind of band aid fix for, you know, Ethereum's slow transactions and super high transaction costs. But now, you know, fast forward a year and a half later, like we're already at the point where, you know, zero knowledge rollup technology, which in my opinion, I think is, you know, has its advantages over optimistic rollups. Like, that's already here. Like it's, you know, not here per se, but it's, it's a few months away. So I think like that's a super good sign where the tech is still being built out. Ethereum is becoming more and more optimal every day. And, and people are kind of still building very, very useful technology and infrastructure within the space. Yeah, it's almost like the market downturn is like a respite for <laughs> for building the infrastructure again cuz it's cheaper since everyone's gone and not flipping NFTs as much or maybe that stuff has moved to Solana. We've touched on a lot of really complex topics and I think it's been a fantastic conversation. I want to land us with a last question or sort of prompt for the Ethereum merge which flows from, you know, this idea of scalability and upgraded infrastructure and is right around the corner and has a lot of economic implications for both the ETH token as well as you know mining and validating activity and all sorts of other things in the space. Yvonne, maybe we go to you for kind of giving us a sense for what's going to happen and then what are some of the potential financial outcomes of that change? Yeah, I think the sort of from a merge standpoint, we really view it as a really important development as the fundamentally the ecosystem with the merge plus the rollups will probably be the next, I would say, big driver of DeFi adoptions from institutional standpoint, right? So I think when we get through the merge and plus the scalability solutions that you're seeing, I think you are getting this kind of modular approach to blockchain Right, where you have a settlement layer, data availability, and execution layer. And I think that will be very attractive to a large institutional investors. 
So we definitely see merge and all the kind of DeFi protocols closely tied to the Ethereum ecosystem, like Polygon is one of them, right? That has lots of capabilities tied to Ethereum. There are others who are doing the staking as well that are closely tied to the Ethereum. So we see that as a massive structural development within the ecosystem. And, you know, one of the things that will be very important from a financial market standpoint to understand that Ethereum will produce very high real yields, right? So we just talked about global macro environment, how we have negative real yields here in U.S., even though we have a very high inflation and inability of central banks basically to use monetary policy as kind of the most levered vehicle. They don't have that anymore, right? So we are probably going to live in a world of depressed real yields for a long time. And I think that opens also the door from a sort of investment standpoint, because after the merge, we will see elevated yields, which should converge longer term to maybe 5%. But over the next 12 months after the merge, we should see very elevated real yields as well. And that will, that will be very beneficial for the Ethereum ecosystem as well. Awesome. David, take us home. Yeah, I would just say just a few things to add on Ivan's comments about the merge. I think that it's super important for the ecosystem. I think it it kind of optimizes Ethereum's transaction costs and transaction speed, which is important for the overall broader Web3 ecosystem because, look, Ethereum can be considered like a moat of liquidity. There's tons of liquidity on Ethereum. Ethereum becomes more optimal and efficient. You, you don't have to leave the Ethereum ecosystem. You can stay here. You don't need the bridge. You don't need the risk. You know, a, a lot of these security things we've seen. But it's important to note that, like, you know, the Ethereum merge isn't going to fix everything. I think, like, relatively speaking, it's still going to be expensive compared to L, other L1s. It's it's overall, you know, its transactions and throughput might not be as fast as other L1s. So I think there's still there's still a multi-chain use case, you know, for some of the other L1s in the space. And I think the other kind of thing that people aren't necessarily talking about is that, like, there's almost a natural monopoly for for staking because staking still relatively expensive for the individual user. It's you know 32 ETH minimum. It requires a level of technical expertise that you know the the lay person isn't going to know. And it also requires like even if you have the technical expertise, you have to kind of monitor and it's like a full time job because if you if, if you're running a validator and your validator doesn't perform right, well then you get slashed and you kind of lose your Ethereum. So with that said, it's a lot easier to kind of go to these other platforms that do like the staking services for you. But I think it's important to keep an eye on on how those staking services begin to collect Ethereum and, and kind of monopolize staked Ethereum. I think that all of these topics are potentially rabbit holes that we could go deeper and deeper into. And I'm so excited that we got to give a flavor of the type of work that you all do to our audience. David Avon, AJ James, thank you so much for joining me for today's conversation. If our listeners want to find out more about the views and opinions of this team, check out consensus.net and in particular the crypto economic research section, which has reports and newsletters that are published on a regular basis. Thanks everyone again. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.